I'm Barb Summer and I'm sitting here today with Dwight Maxa. Um, we're doing an oral visual history interview for the Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind and Hard of Hearing Minnesotans Oral Visual History Project. Mm -hmm. It's June 8th and we are in the Golden Rule Building in downtown St. Paul in the MC, uh, in the offices, the Commission offices. And so with that introduction, I would like to ask Dwight, uh, Mr. Maxa, Dwight Maxa, if you'd please introduce yourself and we'll go into some questions. Okay, my name is Dwight Maxa and I'm here to talk about uh, the beginnings of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services Division and the Commission. Thank you very much. Would you like to, would you start please by telling us how you became interested in or involved in or started looking toward becoming invo involved in this Deaf, the Services mm -hmm. Commission and the work that you do? Okay. Uh, the beginning goes back to about 1976 and my past history was that I started out as a teacher and then became a special ed teacher and then became a special education uh, director and I had just I was just in the throes of completing my doctorate at the university and I had heard about this job and so I contacted uh, the state planning agency and the fellow there that uh, was in charge of this project his name was Dean Honenschlager and it the background is that uh, Rudy Perpich was governor then and some people from the deaf community had contacted the governor and explained to him that services really weren't up to par for deaf people. In fact, they were pretty much non-existent. And I remember, I don't remember everybody, but I remember that Bob Harris and John Scanlon, who was a uh, 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 a psychiatrist at Regents Hospital and I think uh, Sonny Sonnenstrahl, uh, Jerry Nelson and it, it's hard to do the names because I know I'm missing some but anyway this group of people had lunch with the governor at the governor's mansion on Summit Avenue and they talked about I was and I was not there they talked about uh, the state of services and particularly that there was very little available in the rural areas and uh, I have to give the governor credit he was a, I knew him personally and he was a man who really cared about underdogs mm -hmm. and wanted to do something and so he went he approached the state, the state planning agency which at that time was really an arm of the governor's office and asked that something be done so there was a two-year study which was for the purpose of looking at how services were delivered and looking at how rural services might be delivered to a sparsely uh, in a sparsely populated area to a group of people who were way less than one percent of the population and so that project was given to the um, the state planning agency I think it was it was funded by the governor's office and then uh, that's where I came in I was the person that was chosen to do this study. Prior to doing this study, I didn't have a lot of background in uh, work involving deaf people or people who were hard of hearing. Uh, when I first uh, talked to the deaf community, I remember I went to a meeting over at um, MADC at Thompson Hall, and I had to give a little speech. And when I told them that, well, you know, when I was born, I had, uh, uh, I was deaf in my left ear, and it caused me a lot of problems in school because in those days there weren't audiology tests and people you know didn't really pay attention to it but I was in about eighth grade before they finally, fig finally figured out I, I couldn't hear very well and then my hearing started to deteriorate in my in my right ear later on in life but uh, I remember when I said that uh, they all clapped and they were so glad that somebody was doing the project who had some limited understanding of what it would be like to be hard of hearing or deaf. Uh, when, when the study was designed, it was set up so that, you know, there was a fair amount of research done, and I, I was the researcher. But in addition to that, it was also designed uh, so that there could be adequate input from the community. And there was a lot. There were, uh, I can't remember, you know, all of the details, but 
there were there was a large group of people there was a large advisory committee and they had representation from all over the state and the thing that strikes me about that is is how committed people were and you had uh, deaf people and you had mothers of hearing impaired kids and you had adult uh, people with hearing uh, disabilities and they would drive you know from places like uh, Brainerd and Fergus Falls just so that they could offer input and they did it not once but several times over a period of two years now what evolved from that was something called the committee of nine and those were people who came from that larger committee and I, I would think there was probably maybe 25 people on the on the large committee and the committee of nine was a legislative arm that was put together so that they could contact legislators and tell the story that was evolving about the fact that there were few services and something needed to be done. So talk a little bit about your study then. The idea was that if you're going to have legislation then it has to be supported. If it's going to be if it's something that you want to take to legislators and you want to uh, lobby for and get advocates involved, it's got to be based on good information. And so we worked with Gallaudet College. Uh, we worked with the Census Bureau, with uh, the Center for um, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and in several other medical groups, including uh, the University of uh, Minnesota Medical School. And we asked questions about uh, prevalence, about uh, uh, the incidence of, of deafness and hard of hearing, especially uh, with the uh, school age populations. And we even went so far as to uh, lay the information out in age cohorts so that you had uh, zero to five and five to 10, 10 to 20 and so on, even up through uh, 85 plus. So that we, we, all we did is gather the best available information. It may not have been perfect or, or exactly correct, but it, it's all we had. And it was, it, it was a composite of all those sources. So when it went to the legislature, they were pretty impressed that we had taken the time and we could cite not only one source, but many. And that, that study then led into what became the Legislative Commission on the Hearing Impaired. Right. Is that correct? If I met um, the, yeah, the Committee of Nine lobbied the legislature, uh, and we identified legislators that had history of helping other uh, areas like blindness and uh, physical handicaps, so that um, we actually explained to them what we found, uh, explained what some of the service needs were, and then asked them to support a bill, which I wrote at the State Planning Agency. And that bill was the Hearing Impaired Services Act. Uh, and it went pretty well. Uh, our strategy from the beginning was that we would uh, work with a, a bipartisan group. And uh, this was 35 years ago, and the political climate was much different. And there were people who uh, really wanted to do the right thing and you just I just didn't see the kind of political infighting that we see today uh, it was it was hard to find the difference between a liberal Republican and a conservative Democrat and that was kind of the coming together point and so we actually enjoyed pretty good support for what we were doing and it's never easy to get a bill passed like this especially a bill that has what we call tails in other words, if you pass it today, you're going to be living with it 20 years from now. And that came up. I mean, legislators were concerned about, well, what is this going to cost? And what's it going to look like, you know, in five years or 10 years? But we were able to convince them that, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an important bill and it needs to be passed. And it especially needs to be passed because the people that it affects are not getting uh, equal services. In fact, back then, uh, there were cases where if you were in a hospital and you wanted uh, to understand what was happening, you had to pay an interpreter to, to help you. Or you had to use a family member. If you used a family member, oftentimes it was a child, and then it put the child in a very difficult place, and you may or may not get accurate information. 
But the Hearing Impaired Services Act had a, it took a lot of work, didn't it, actually, to get it? it, how, it well, it did, it. and I, I think if, if there was a contribution that, that I made, it was uh, writing a good bill. And I had a lot of help at the state planning agency. And in fact, uh, I mentioned, uh, or maybe I didn't, Dean Honenschlager was the person at the state planning agency who was my boss. And coming from education, I didn't know all that much about state government, but I learned in a hurry. And he was, uh, he was really good to me. He helped me learn how to work the system. And that's really uh, oftentimes what uh, is, gets missed with advocates when they bring legislation in. So uh, the governor had asked us to put together a model that would allow for service delivery in rural areas. And so the idea came up that we would have regional service centers. And that was uh, uh, an important part of the bill. And at the time, it was new thinking. Um, there were other states that were, that were planning legislation like this, but uh, they never quite developed their thinking uh, to that extent. And so the legislation allowed for eight centers and a, and a division uh, that would, uh, that would uh, per oversee services and would uh, act as a, a liaison with the State Department uh, of uh, Human Services. And that became what, the Deaf Services Division? Is that correct? That, that eventually became the Deaf Services Division. Okay. And actually the division was, uh, or the program uh, was formed in 1978, but it wasn't a division. It was just a program and people weren't, the, the people in government weren't quite sure what to do with it, and they didn't particularly like it either, that here's one more thing they had to do and with not enough money. Uh, wisely, the legislature had phased it in so that the first uh, couple years, we were to put up three centers, and then six centers, and then two more after that. So it was like a four-year phase in. And that, that was a good thing, because I think if we were to try to do all eight right away, we would have failed. Really? Because it was, it's so hard to, uh, to find, uh, well back then it was really hard to find good staff and that's the key. You know, you have to have people who really have uh, a background in deafness or are deaf so that uh, they can lead others. And part of the regional center concept was that we would, the centers would uh, work with counties and would, it would be like a, a technical assistance project. They would teach the counties uh, things that they needed to know in order to provide equitable service. How large were the, uh, how, in, in terms of staff and stuff, were the regional service centers? And I know, or what did you think would be an appropriate level of service? Um, well, the, when, the, when the bill passes, they usually pass some money with it, and then they pass uh, whatever they think positions are needed to get the job done. So I remember uh, at the beginning, I think we had a staff of three, but yet we had uh, the mandate to do these centers and we couldn't really do them because they didn't give us the staff. So it was like that. I mean, nothing ever starts easy. And so it was every year going back and explaining and asking and explaining. And I will say that the legislators that we worked with were good. They were good to us, but they wanted assurances that we we're going to do what we said we were going to do, and they didn't want any failures. And so it all evolved over time, and uh, we started with three, and I don't know how many are in the division today, but I think um, during the end of my tenure, I think we had 25 people. In the Deaf Services Division yeah. of the Department of yeah. Human Services. Yeah. So that, that actually was, what was the role of the Deaf Services Division then to oversee the regional service centers but also to look at more of a statewide approach or? And I don't even know if I can remember where they were but uh, Fergus Falls and Rochester, um, St. Paul, uh, they had one for the metro area here. There was one in Duluth, um, I think one in uh, Two Harbors and uh, I, you know, I can't, I think yeah. that's, that's all I can remember. Yeah. yeah. But then the, the Deaf Services Division itself, the mandate was to 
as you under as you started to develop yeah. it then was to start to um, look at the state overall as well or yeah. talk a little bit about okay. the Deaf Services Division. Um, one of the things that uh, we were being held up to for comparison was Services for the Blind and they did a lot of things and we actually patterned ourselves after them uh, for a period of time and we also uh, at that time uh, the human services part of it was uh, help with social services, you know, help with um, child support, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, those kinds of issues because that's what the Department of Human Services do does. So the technical assistance and the interface with those services was through the division here in St. Paul. The uh, rehabilitation, uh, what we call DVR at that time, uh, that was done separately. And so uh, we would refer, and that was a big job for the, our, for the uh, regional centers and for the division to constantly be referring people to different services. It was a central entry point. In fact, I think that language is in the bill. Central entry point. And that way people uh, could, deaf people and hard of hearing people could come there, come to the center, and they would be referred and then we'd have like a case manager that would go with them and troubleshoot problems. And I think that's less of an issue today, but at the beginning, that's, that was really the main purpose of, and the main methodology of how we did things. It's interesting to note that uh, about, I think, four years into the program, into the creation of the program, uh, we felt that uh, we should combine uh, vocational rehabilitation and our division. And so there was legislation that addressed that, and the legislature made the decision to uh, take resources from the, uh, the Division of uh, Rehabilitation and bring those together, and that, in, that increased the size and the budget of the Deaf Services Division considerably. And why did you decide to do that? Uh, you know, a comment about that would be that uh, at the same time that we were doing this work, other states were doing it as well. And there was a movement in the country to uh, find a way to equalize things and, and uh, some of the federal legislation, uh, legislation that passed like the ADA and that was a, a big factor. But uh, what I want to say is that uh, I think one of the key things for Minnesota was the placement of the services. And I know that uh, there were states where the legislation passed but it never quite got any traction, and then it, it w and then in a few years it was gone. And the reason I think it got traction is because we were able to put the division in one of the largest state departments, if not the largest state department, where we had a lot of uh, people that were willing to help us, and to teach us, and to show us how to do things. But having and then having that status, the status of being a division helped us with the legislature because we weren't reporting to the mental health division or to the social services division. We were seen as a, uh, an important part of government. And I noticed that when I studied, I did a follow-up study after the uh, Hearing Impaired Services Act and I looked at how other states were doing. And I noticed that the ones that failed had failed in that regard. They had ended up uh, in some small corner of a social services division or part of vocational rehab and they never had the status to really pull themselves up. And we did pattern ourselves after services for the blind because they too were a division and kind of a uh, important part of, of the department they were in. And you had visibility that way, you had, all, you had a lot, lot going on. We had credibility with uh, legislators that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I need to grab some water here. Yeah. Um, yep, I, okay. Are you, um, and that, as that started to grow and you started to have the regional, what were some of the needs that you felt you were, were critical, say 35 years ago, and we know things have changed, but were some, what were some of the needs that you felt were most critical that you, through the Deaf Services Division, wanted to see, see yeah. help being given to? 
Well, I, can, I think two things. One was uh, the communications at all levels. And now with all the services that we have, including Caption TV, um, you don't necess you, you, you take it for granted. But then there was no captioning and no one would pay for it. And that was a hard fight. And I, I think the commission really was instrumental in getting that done. But if you went to a hospital for services, um, there was always an argument about who was going to pay for it. Or even if you went to a welfare department, like if you were in Ramsey County and you went to Ramsey County Services, they would argue and say, we don't have to provide an interpreter. Uh, and they were, of course, wrong. And it took several years to teach them that they were wrong because you could go in and tell them and say, you know, you really can't do that. And they'd say, yeah, well, too bad, we're going to do it anyway. So it took, you know, many years of kind of badgering and cajoling and showing them the legislation to get them on board and to get them to really not just do it, but to embrace it. And so it was just trial and error and just, you had to be uh, uh, very tenuous. The other piece was, um, The, uh, you know, it escapes me now. Yeah, communication. People talk a lot about communication. Yeah, I, yeah. but go ahead. Is there another one that you... The, 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 the part about um, what I'm trying to say here is uh, the people themselves uh, had real needs, not just communication, but they had uh, issues like... Um, just being left out. I remember in those days, for example, deaf people who graduated, many of the guys ended up in printing shops because it was so noisy and loud that uh, they were it just it was assumed, well, if you're deaf, then you'll make a good printer. And, you know, we kind of laugh at it now, but uh, that was really the case. And so that was another area that opened up was uh, the division worked hard to teach employers uh, what advantage there is to hiring someone with a hearing impairment. And uh, the same with schools. Uh, the children uh, oftentimes weren't taken seriously because they maybe had a mild hearing impairment or maybe they were actually deaf, but the school didn't know quite what to do. And so uh, the division was again in a teaching role. So I guess the, the two-part thing would be the communication and then to address the real needs of people who had disability. And almost fighting, a, is it a stereotype or something that you're fighting or not? Or would you, is that a wrong way of describing it? Um, yeah, I, I think it was a stereotype. It's, <clears throat> it's changed. The things have changed so much I've completely forgotten that that was a problem, but it was a problem, yes. Well, and from that work then, you also started um, moving toward the development of the Commission mm -hmm. for Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing Minnesotans, which started out, what, as MCHI, perhaps? Is that correct? Minnesota Commission for Hearing Impaired? or is Right. How did yeah, that it, get? Uh, a little bit about that. Yeah. I'm, can I go back and just say one other thing oh, about... Oh, uh, yes, definitely. Uh, the, on the communication side, uh, now we have email. But I remember when I first started, uh, I was given a TTY machine, which was an old teletype machine that had been converted for use by a, name, by a person by the name of Gordon Allen who supplied many of us with these machines. And I had one in my house and I had one in my office. And it was really this big. I mean, it was like five feet across and about two feet uh, in depth. Amazing. And, and that's what it took. We had to sit there at the keyboard and, you know, type and clunk, 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 you know. It was, uh, you know, that, that, it's, it's hard to, to, to imagine that it was really that bad only 35 years ago. And of course now things have completely changed, but the point is that the communication was a, a big thing as far as people trying to order a pizza. You know, how do you do that? 
Uh, you'd have to find somebody that can use the phone, maybe a friend or whatever, and, and have them do it for you. So I, I wanted to highlight that part. Well, and safety issues would have been a factor, I would think. And, you know, for that too, you, of course, yeah. How, mm -hmm. do you, how, do you, how do you deal with a, a tornado alert? How do, you di how do you dial 911 when there's yeah. nobody that has a TTY? Right. That was true at one time. Mm -hmm. Just all. In fact, I think you were quoted as saying once that in 19, most people got telephones in 1910, and 1975 is when we started seeing yeah. it come into the yeah. community. Well, uh, regarding the commission, um, the, the way that came about is kind of interesting. Uh, by that time, uh, the, the division had been lobbying the uh, legislature and like every year trying to get a little bit more resources so we could do the job they already gave us to do. So we were uh, pretty adamant about uh, working and just not uh, giving up. And at one point, uh, some of them got kind of tired of us. And they said, you know, you need to define your role here as a division. Are you uh, an arm of state government? Are you a division that provides uh, services to people, uh, social services and, and uh, all of the other things that people need so that they can, uh, so they can enjoy the same level of support as everybody else? Uh, we don't see where, according to you being in the State Department, how you can be here lobbying. And they were absolutely right. They caught us because we were doing way too much lobbying. And so that's actually, when that happened, that's about the time the idea came along that what we need here is a commission so that their sole purpose is to work with legislators and other policy makers so that they can develop a better understanding of what people need. And it was a huge success right from the beginning because they, they kind of had no holds bar, barred. They could go out and do the, what needed to be done. And we always had to hold back a little bit because we had a, a kind of an identity crisis. You represented the DHS on the commission, as I yeah. understand it. You know, I, I, uh, I really don't remember much about it. About it. I, I know it was very small at the beginning, and. I really don't remember who was on it even, except for Kurt Mitchka, who came to be the, the, the director and, and a very good one. Um, there were different uh, deaf people that were brought in uh, and taught how to approach legislators. And of course, that was another thing where other disability groups, because speech wasn't a barrier or hearing wasn't a barrier, um, they kind of automatically knew the drill and what to do. But our constituents uh, didn't, and they had to be it, things had to be taught and broken down and explained. And I think everybody has seen this big chart that Bob Cook drew about the uh, implement or the, the development and implementation of the Hearing Impaired Services Act. That was an, that was actually a teaching tool more than anything. It was a visual tool so that people in the deaf and hard of hearing community could look at that and understand. So it, it wasn't necessarily for show, it was a teaching tool. And so that's what you were doing was actually, as you began, was to begin to teach people how to be, right. to advocate. Yeah, yeah we started with advocate. nothing. And then people who expressed an interest in wanting to work with legislators gradually began to show up. They gradually developed uh, skills and good skills in how to present their argument. And I think they're still doing it today, too. Uh, you know, the people come and go and their energies uh, burn out and you've got to get more people and uh, it's a constant struggle, but um, that's what it was all about was, you know, the teaching and then go forth and do. Um, and then in, in that case, um, were, there, were there any uh, areas of that where you felt the commission really, you know, needed to seek its, do its work? Any specific areas of need in the community that you saw that the commission the needed? commission take hold and work on? Yeah, well, you know, they've been responsible for uh, just a whole bunch of legislation uh, that they have created, um, and I know most of the interpreting laws that we have today are a result of the work that was done by the commission. Uh, 
Uh, I know that there, uh, there's an infant screening bill that was just passed a few years back that requires that all hospitals screen newborns for uh, uh, deafness. And that was something that they did. Uh, the whole having been out of the field for a while, I don't remember uh, all the other things, that, all the other uh, issues and, and needs that have been taken care of, but I do know there are many. There's, it's just such a evolvement of things that at the beginning everybody was happy with having an interpreter, but then they soon realized that an interpreter that works in the court system and one, one that works in the hospitals and one that works for social services, they, that one person might not, might not be adequate to cover all those bases. And so the commission uh, went to work and developed uh, legislation that would require those uh, uh, providers to have qualified interpreters. And then at the same time had to back up and work with um, some of the training institutions here to provide the classes necessary so that could happen. Um, development, as you asked about the development of the mission, and then you mentioned how you separated, and let's talk a little okay. bit about that. Um, we had gotten criticism that the division was just going too far into the political world, and so the uh, commission was really created so that it could do the interfacing with uh, policymakers and lobbyists or uh, uh, legislators and so on. And at that point, uh, we made a decision to separate ourselves from the commission uh, because we had to. So I did have a presence at the very beginning, and I, I was there, but I uh, was I, I phased myself out as soon as I could because uh, they really needed to operate independently. There are several, again, it's placement in government that's important. The, there are several places, or there are several uh, ways you can do the work. Uh, you could be a committee, uh, you can be a commission, you can be probably three or four other things. But the commission was really the highest level, and it was not easy getting that passed because the legislature was very reticent about wanting to have another commission. And uh, commissions just, they have more power and they're listened to. Where a committee, maybe not so much. Oh, it took a little work? Yeah, it, it actually didn't pass the first year. I think it took uh, two or three years to get that word in. Yeah, the word commission. And to, and to get the support for it that way. Mm -hmm. Right. But. You stayed in. You stayed the course. You didn't say no. We'll we'll we'll, we'll accept committee or we'll accept. No, something else. no, that was that was not an option for the deaf community. They were absolutely convinced that it, that's what needed to happen, and they stuck with it, and it, and it did happen. Yeah, it mm -hmm. did. And actually, you know, as the time passed and the and the commission became uh, more independent and more um, just better at what they did. We had a number of cases where our division didn't agree with the commission, which is inevitable. You know, that's, that's how it is. And that's a good thing. So, I mean, we, uh, at the end of the day, the division has to support the Department of Human Services, and they have their mandates, and they tell us what has to happen. But that may or may not be in the best interest of the uh, people we serve, and so that's where the commission comes in. They have, uh, uh, they're there for the purpose of making known what the needs of the community are. So they're two different roles. Was it, is the commission more of an advocacy organization? Would Absolutely. You? Okay, that's it so is one hundred percent advocacy. So you see it out there, maybe identifying issues that need to be dealt with, um, mm -hmm. being active in, in in working with the community that way. Right. Uh, Again, that's uh, something that evolved. Uh, a, a commission does just what you said. Uh, a better commission not only identifies the needs, but does the research to support it and writes the legislation so that it can pass and then lobbies the legislators and educates the community. And that's what this one does. So it's. Uh, They've done some excellent work. I think if I were to rank uh, nationally, I think Minnesota's is number one. 
we asked about some of the other areas that the commission has been, or you know, that where, where the needs for the community that you know obviously involve both the Department of Human Services and the and the um, commission. And ta we've talked about communication, and that is, comes up so uh, you know that's so critical. But uh, a little bit on education, or and you've mentioned public education, outreach, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Is there anything more you'd like to say about that? I think uh, with education, there is a definite division between our work or the work of the uh, the division of uh, getting confused with divisions here the division of uh, deaf and hard of hearing services you know they have a, a role and then there's the department of education which has of course a role in educating children the thing is that they set their own policy and it's very difficult for us to tell them how it's going to be we can advise them, we can offer technical assistance, which is what we did. But we um, didn't have any real authority over the policies that they set at, at, you know, for uh, uh, youngsters and for uh, uh, high school and so on. There are some federal mandates that address that, but here again we go right back to the commission again, where they can uh, recommend to them uh, changes without any conditions and they can lo lobby uh, to make those changes happen and, and the Department of Education doesn't necessarily have to agree with them but our, de our department here uh, we have no influence or very little. Yeah and so actually what you're talking about when you're talking about changes in the classroom you're talking about access to interpreters um, what else are you talking about what, or what kinds of things are you talking about in the classroom? Uh, Actually, I, if you go back to the very beginning, um, uh, deaf and hard of hearing students, the, I think hard of hearing were probably okay, but deaf students weren't necessarily mainstreamed. They were put into special programs for deaf kids. And then, of course, there was uh, the state school in Faribault. So things have changed a lot, and now uh, school districts have to mainstream students and that means that uh, there's a lot of exposure to interpreters and to sign language and you've got other uh, students who see that and want to learn. So. Well an ASL I think has been accepted as a, a, a recognized language is that was there wasn't there some work actually in that direction as well? Yeah. In understanding how the role of ASL and, and how it should be used in a school. Yeah, that, that's, used. that's true. There was a time when ASL was a language that was spoken by deaf people and no one really seemed to recognize uh, the value. And mm -hmm. uh, later on, uh, that's exactly what happened. It was recognized as a, as a real language and treated accordingly. Yeah. And so there are, uh, all of these are changes that have just sounds as if there's been a, uh, you've fought for or you've identified or, you know, I mean, you in a broad sense, people have fought for and identified and continue to work toward. Right. You know, in all of this. Um, the commission became the, uh, included deaf blind. I mean, it was, you want to talk a little bit about that, I think, uh, mm -hmm. and how that came about as well and uh, including that in the mission. Yeah, uh, fairly early on, uh, we, uh, one of the needs that came up was that uh, the deaf and hard of hearing, um, the deaf blind uh, were pretty much left out of things even though we were making progress with deaf and hard of hearing people. They were sort of still castaways. Uh, at the time, uh, the Services for the Blind was doing some work, but it's a, a they didn't have the resources they needed to serve that population because the typically they didn't have uh, any understanding of ASL or sign language or even signed English. And so the, we as a division made a decision to go forward and, and make it known that we wanted to work with deaf blind people and were willing to do what we needed to do. And they became, they, they now come to us uh, as part of that central mm -hmm. entry point where they can be uh, referred back for services that they need. But we have a long history with the blind people, and I think we were part of uh, the original uh, effort to get uh, interpreters for deaf blind people. 
And I, I think you know that uh, interpreting is done in the hand, obviously, mm -hmm. because they can't see. Yeah, and so that again was another area almost of education, I would think, um, as you tried to help people understand what was needed. Right. Yeah. yeah. They, they really, they were misunderstood. They really didn't fit in. And uh, there was such a small number that uh, they never really got traction. But once we included them with the deaf and the hard of hearing and so on, then things changed. Is there anything that you, as we've talked about this, we've talked about some of the areas in that you, you've worked with. What would you, um, what do you see the needs are, what would, how would you identify the needs today, or talk about a little bit about change, and then a little bit about the future? Well, th this is a hard one for me because um, I've been away for so long that I don't know that I can really talk uh, about you know today's needs okay. I, I really don't know uh, what about I, one thing I do ponder is the impact of email and how that's affected deaf people okay how it's affected if we have about a minute left would you like to comment on what you would hope for the future uh, I I think that uh, as I see it people uh, in the deaf and hard of hearing community are doing very well and I hope things continue and I hope that things uh, at the legislative level uh, are such that this program and the other programs don't go backwards. That's I think a real fear I have. So that meeting at Thompson Hall when you were received the applause early on has carried you through, carried through your career sounds like. It has. Um, I, I definitely like the work. I, I was kind of a long shot, I think, for someone to take on that project, uh, but um, it all worked out, and I'm happy. I'm very proud of what's been done. I'm proud of all the people that are doing the work today and all the ones who gave contributions uh, year by year. Uh, there's been many people that have uh, left, and some have come back. But it's been, uh, from my perspective, one of the most satisfying experiences that a person can have. Although I don't know that I was a huge success financially because I was a, uh, a employee, a state employee. I was excited then and I still get excited about it now. Thank you.